data engineering system design is generally very different than normal software engineering system design. Because as a backend engineer, you mostly build applications and as a data engineer, you build data pipelines that support those applications. So concepts like routing or APIs or load balancing, caching, they are not as useful to you as a data engineer if you are learning about system design. Uh, in fact, I created a couple of videos on this, one where I'm explaining the difference between system design rounds in both of these different roles, and another one where I'm talking about uh, how to crack system design rounds for data engineers in good product companies. So I'm going to link both of them in the description if you want to check it out. But as a part of this video, we are going to go through seven most common and most widely used system design patterns in the world of data engineering and we'll not only go through them but we'll also understand some example architectures of tech giants like Netflix, Uber, Amazon, Zalando, Coca-Cola who use these system designs on their day-to-day -day operations. So you will not only be really good at interviews if you master these designs but you will also be a really really good data engineer if you learn them. As you can see, they are divided into two categories, data processing architectures where these patterns mainly address how data flows through a system, how events are processed in real time or batch. On the other hand, we have data management and domain oriented architectures where these patterns deal more with how data is modeled, stored, governed rather than how it is processed. I'm Josh and I'm a senior software engineer at DoorDash working on generative AI based data products. And before that, I was at Google as a data engineer first and then as an AI engineer. Before we get started, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel if you have not already. Already. Once you've done that, let's jump right in. Number one is Lambda architecture. The core idea of architecture is that Lambda architecture splits processing into two distinct layers. So why it matters? Like it gives you a good view of your historic data and it also handles real-time data. So it is also kind of fault tolerant if your real-time pipeline fails, your historic or batch pipeline will automatically fix real-time pipeline after a day or two. But there are some cons as well, like the complexity of pipeline increases because you are maintaining two different, completely different components. And there can also be some data duplication because the same data flows through both of these components. So it can be a little hard to govern or manage at times. Now let's look at a real world example of Netflix. One data store powers overnight aggregated insights while real time pipelines adjust recommendations as you watch. As you can see, there are a lot of data sources. Some of them go through Apache Kafka and Apache Flink, which is the real time component. And a lot of them also go through batch pipeline, which is supported on Spark. And eventually they use different storage like Cassandra, RDS, S3, depending on the freshness of data. Next is Kappa architecture. So Kappa architecture is a little different than lambda so it has only one layer instead of two different like batch and real time it only has a real time layer and if you want to do any batch processing you do that by replaying events through message processing or queue systems like Kafka. But if we compare it with Lambda architecture at a high level, you can see it has lower complexity, easier to maintain. Real-time processing support is much better, but batch processing support is not as good. And you can see also example use cases. So Uber's core infra is built upon Kafka. It is functioning as a central nervous system for data management. Kappa architecture enables Uber to efficiently ingest and process a lot of data streams from GPS, user interactions, driver updates, allowing quick reactions to changing conditions. Like you would have seen things like price go up and down and that's why they rely a lot on real-time data pipeline processing for batch processing what they do is they wait for some events to occur at the same time so they might have multiple triggers like trigger t1 trigger t2 as you see here and whatever like before t1 you can see event 1 and 2 happening so event 1 and 2 is combined and then they perform windowed aggregation and then they go to a state one. So that's like semi batch approach. And between T2 and T1, you can see three different events. So they are aggregated together. So it's not only used for real time, but it can also be used for batch. But as, as I said, it's not as optimal and it is computer intensive. We have just explored a couple of design patterns. And at this point, you might be thinking, wow, these are really powerful. Imagine the possibilities if I dig in. If you are ready to push these concepts even further and turn them into your next big data engineering career move, I have something I'm genuinely excited to share with you. Simply Learn is the world's number one online bootcamp for technology, business, and programming training. They offer a professional certificate program in data engineering designed to help you unleash your full potential. Over seven months, you'll attend interactive live demo sessions taught by industry experts, work with cutting edge tools, and tackle more than 10 hands-on plus three capstones, the perfect way to build a good portfolio. You'll learn all the essentials, think like Hadoop, Spark, AWS, Azure, all aligned with top certificates from Microsoft, AWS, and Snowflake. 
Simply Learn learners have been able to get 150% of maximum hike, 70% average hike, and they have collaboration with over 2,900 plus hiring partners. Their alumni are in top companies like Amazon, Google, JP Morgan, and more. And you can also see the detailed reviews on their website. Also, Simply Learn is reviewed and recommended by Forbes. So whether you are an aspiring data enthusiast or a seasoned pro, this program could be your ticket to accelerate your data engineering career. So check out the link in the description to know more or link in the pinned comment and uh, enroll while the seats are still available and let's continue to the rest of this video event driven microservices architecture so for example in in places like amazon they have different microservices for each layer of their application so if you see amazon's examples so the order processing is broken into multiple microservices like inventory payment shipping you can see here product basket ordering all of these microservices can have different architecture in this example they are both all of them are using lambda and dynamodb but it can be really anything else so events like order placed triggered child events in other services without building direct dependencies. In this example, they go through AWS SQS queue, but instead of SQS, you can use literally any queue like Kafka, RevitaM queue. Uh, and the idea is that one microservices sends message into this queue as soon as it has done processing. And that's where the second microservices also knows that yeah, I mean, it has to pick up that processing. One thing that's very hard to do, how do you ensure exactly once processing of these messages because sometimes when you drop a message on queue there are multiple consumers listening to it if one of the consumers have processed that event you have to notify it as soon as possible so that other consumer does not duplicately process the event and waste compute power in it so you have to design a little bit of complex acknowledgement management system to ensure that you handle these very gracefully next is serverless pipelines so serverless pipelines only use serverless services like maybe aws lambda google cloud functions or azure functions and they are even orchestrated on a serverless platform like aws step function so you only pay for what you use so the difference between a server and a serverless pipeline is that server essentially you manage that server in terms of infrastructure but in case of services like lambda you just specify how much of ram and, and processing power you want and as soon as the event comes it will automatically spin up it will process that event and it will shut down so it will only allow you to pay for how much of time that you have used and at the same time you will focus more on the application logic instead of worrying about infrastructure and service so let's look at the case study of coca-cola so the logic behind vending machines is quite straightforward when client buys a drink machine calls payment gateway to verify the purchase which makes rest api calls to aws api gateway which triggers a lambda now this lambda will handle all the business logic behind transactions and data processing if a user initiated the transaction to a mobile device they will get a fifth step like which is a push notification in their phone to submit information through Android or Apple Pay. So while serverless sounds great, but it has some disadvantage, like it has a maximum execution time limit, like AWS Lambda has a 15 minute execution time limit. Amazon Prime actually famously moved from serverless architecture before now to a monolithic architecture and they saved 90% of cost in the process. So it's not like serverless, just because it's fancier, it's always better to use. Next is command query responsibility segregation and event sourcing. Most of banking applications use this type of pipeline where financial transactions are logged as events. So you can see commands which are write heavy, which is open account, withdraw funds, things like that, and queries which are read heavy, find all accounts by query or find the balance they are separated out and both of them have their separate data pipeline processing a lot of times it happens like when you want to withdraw for example withdraw account balance you might also need to call uh, query account balance after your withdrawal is done to find out how much balance you have left sometimes your write pipeline components can call your read pipeline components so they are connected through kafka and all the event sourcing essentially contains a complete auditable log. In, in other words, all other state changes that have applied to object or an entity is captured instead of storing just the latest or current state. Next is data mesh architecture. So in a complex organization, you have different teams for like finance, sales, marketing, even for HR departments, right? So instead of having one AWS account or cloud account for all of these teams, you have different AWS or cloud accounts. These accounts actually can talk with each other. So one team can produce data for another team to consume and another team can consume it without actually having to copy the data. So there's a producer, there's a consumer, and then there is also a central account that has all the data catalog which is like the metadata of all data stored in the producer account so it's like opening up gates to share your data without actually having to copy it so that's the most elegant part of it and it also means that all these business domain teams they have decentralized ownership so instead of having one it or data management team all of these teams like let's say finance sales all of these teams can have their different 
data governance or data management like access protocols in place. So the burden of IT or data management is moved from one centralized team to all of these domain centric teams. Zalando uses this data lake architecture. For example, they have different account for ingestion and then completely different account for serving. But then they use a separate account where all of their metadata about storage is kept here. Next is data lake house architecture. Data lake is where you get the most flexibility. You can store your data in any format you want. And it's also very cheap in terms of storage. Data warehouse, on the other hand, it restricts you to store data in a table like format and maybe in databases and schemas. It is more expensive because it is more optimized to run SQL based queries on it and it gives you much faster results. With data lake house, you combine the pros of both of these approaches. So for example, you can store your data on Amazon Redshift as well and you can also store it on S3. So Redshift becomes your data warehouse and S3 becomes your data lake. So that's where Glue Catalog comes into play. It creates Athena tables on your S3 data so you can access it directly. There are file formats that you can stick to so that it provides better data warehouse capabilities within your data lake. Like Delta Lake is a widely used file format. Iceberg is also a widely used file format. But there are some interoperability challenges. So for example, the Iceberg that Databricks produces, if you consume that Iceberg file within Snowflake, it might not be most optimized solution. But if you want to learn more, I highly recommend taking this course from Databricks, which is the Databricks Lakehouse Fundamentals. And in my opinion, right now, Databricks is the most mature platform if you are going with a Lakehouse architecture. So in summary, each of these seven patterns, they solve a different kind of problem. And in real world, you will not exclusively use one pattern over another. In fact, your best bet would be to use a combination of two to three patterns that we discussed here in this video and apply it in your data pipeline. Which one of these patterns do you like the most and which of these has the most challenges, right, in your opinion? Let's talk about it in the comment section below. And that's it from my side. See you next time.